So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Li Hui Sai um, from MIT today. Um, it, it's a great privilege to do this, to connect kind of this whole seminar series uh, in, in Professor Tsai's talk, because uh, we began this spring talking about um, uh, light as a scaffold for organizing uh, whole biological systems. And so today, I think uh, Dr. Tsai will give us a, a view towards looking specifically at whole brain function um, and how uh, something that seems anomalous, if you're not familiar with her group's work, uh, may be uh, a real key to understanding some of these challenges that we've seen in dementia research, Alzheimer's disease research, and other clinical uh, uh, challenges that are related or relevant to quantum biology. So let's start with In 1972, Philip Anderson, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, wrote a nice uh, little essay uh, in science called More is Different. And uh, in this, uh, from which this figure on the left is taken. And so I kind of wanted to hearken back to uh, Dr. Anderson's work because, uh, you know, while uh, Dr. Tsai is, is certainly more in the biological clinical arena, uh, there's a strong connection between this idea that at every scale of physical reality, as well as chemical and biological reality, we have uh, a set of, of laws that in some sense can be derived from more fundamental laws, but in another sense, don't need those fundamental laws. For example, um, to, to understand how to build bridges and build rocket ships, or even to put a helicopter on Mars and go up and down, we, we can create sort of models that coarse grain or roughly estimate uh, theories that we have from quantum field theory and quantum mechanics. We don't need to use those very refined, uh, fine particulate understandings of reality in order to build these things for the most part. We can sort of coarse grain into Young's moduli and shear and stress tensors. And then we can use those things to build uh, things that are based on classical physics, right? And so uh, Philip Anderson makes this point very strongly in the idea that um, just because we examine the fundamental theories of reality, and we have to understand what the parameters of those physical theories are, we must understand that at every new level or scale, there's a whole new rich phenomenology that we must understand and appreciate. And I think um, Professor Tsai's work really fits in there in the understanding of the brain. Um, on the right, this is uh, from a book chapter we wrote uh, two years ago. Uh, looking at kind of how the world of quantum fluctuations at the scale of the attosecond, the picosecond, um, the femtosecond, how could these quantum fluctuations be implicated on the scale of the brain, at which the, the scale that Professor Tsai is going to talk about today is really at the Hertz scale. So this is, you know, 18 orders of magnitude that are stretching from these quantum fluctuations to the brain going through uh, biomolecular complexes to neurons, neural networks in the brain. And so um, like Stephen Hawking, who, who popularized this theory of everything, but then um, on his deathbed sort of recanted the hubris of such a theory, understanding these emergent phenomena will become critical for understanding that, yes, you can describe uh, fundamentally quantum phenomena in classical manners and you know understanding what is truly quantum that cannot be described classically from what is uh you know able to be described in a coarse grain classical manner is cr crucial but it's also important to recognize that these these phenomenologies that are happening in the quantum world that are uh let's say non-unitarily or reducing themselves into classical phenomena that are measurable by biologists and clinicians that uh we recognize that there is an intimate dynamism between the two worlds so um in 1932 niels bohr gave a lecture on light and life 
And so we're going to take the idea of how do uh, light stimuli or how do uh, external photonic stimuli um, affect living processes specifically in the brain. And so by now, I know many of you have seen this, this picture, which ultimately looks kind of at a bottom up approach of the neuron and the brain. And so we have this kind of working picture of uh, this intimate nexus between the mitochondrial reticula and the cytoskeleton, uh, composed of not only actin filaments and intermediate filaments, but also uh, microtubules. And in this intimate dynamism, we think of you know, these, these biophotons that are potentially being emitted from free radicals that are emitted from mitochondria. But what Professor Tsai's work, I think, makes us consider is what are the driving processes from a top-down perspective? Because if, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll present a little bit about what her work reveals to us, but this idea of an external non-invasive flicker that is visually rendered, but then can stimulate neuronal networks to then uh, change morphology of those networks could then possibly stimulate uh, networks of uh, different aromatic molecules that could then be implicated at the quantum level. So there is possibly from a bottom-up approach, things we can do to, to modulate, enhance, um, alter. But today we're really gonna focus on uh, the alternative view, which is from the level of the brain, the visual stimulus and the neuron, how might these things be implicated at the biomolecular level? So this is a, 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 a snapshot from the Human Brain Project. And as you can see, and as I've mentioned, we have in the brain these very divergent spatial, temporal, and energy scales. And so doc, today, Dr. Tsai is going to be right in the middle of this uh, dynamic hierarchy or milieu. And she's going to really focus on this center regime of uh, the Hertz scale, but then also to understand some of the biomolecular downstream effects that are a result of uh, this amazing finding. And so now that I've alluded to it, in 2018, this was a nature paper that Dr. Tsai's group and uh, in collaboration with Edward Boyden, Emory Brown, and some others um, have, have found that this uh, particularly 40 Hertz uh, frequency this flicker in Alzheimer's disease mice was able to um, uh, reduce amyloid load through this so-called gamma entrainment. And so um, there, there were a number of downstream effects and I hope today Dr. Tsai will tell us a little bit about some of the clinical trials that have emerged at the human level from these uh, experiments in mice. But these downstream effects include um, an increase in spatial learning and memory for the mice a loss uh, or a decrease in synaptic loss and an increase in vesicle trafficking um, in the microglia and the neurons. So this is uh, really exciting from the level of uh, a physical stimulus um, that's non-invasive that uh, can entrain uh, the brain. And it raises questions about uh, even things like meditation and other types of uh, phenomena that have been historically associated with such gamma synchronies. So um, just, just to give a sense of how this complicates our view of artificial intelligence and consciousness. So um, I've presented this uh, in, in my introductory talk, but this is kind of a lower computational brown, uh, bound for the human brain's uh, computational capacity, uh, given if you look at the neuron as the basic computational unit. If you go into the cytoskeleton and you assume only the, you know, you reduce the entire cell to a single type of protein, you increase that computational capacity by 10 orders of magnitude. And if you use atoms and you, you're even more exhausted, you increase that by another 10 orders of magnitude. And so we're looking uh, really at uh, advancing not just the nature of consciousness as, um, you know, saying, okay, we can take this consciousness, download it into an intelligence, but it also uh, complicates our view of the complexity of the interactions in this light and life feedback loop. So something to, to think about are the energetic considerations of uh, what's happening in Dr. Tsai's work. 
but then also um, the classical versus quantum mechanisms that may be at play in uh, the brain that if it were scaling according to our classical computers, we would have several nuclear power plants worth of energy output um, between our ears. So um, let's, let's move from these partitions that we have in um, sort of a, a reductionist science to uh, this kind of wholeness and interconnectivity that Herman Weil and other founders of uh, quantum mechanics and, and other scientists like Dr. Tsai um, have, have presented us. So today uh, I would just like to say that uh, Dr. Tsai is the Picower Professor of Neuroscience at MIT, the director of the Picower Institute for Learning and Memory. Her lab investigates disorders of memory and cognition, in particular neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's disease at scales ranging from the molecular and cellular to that of circuits and systems. So her work has highlighted important roles in neurodegeneration for the dysregulation of chromatin and genomic integrity, as well as the kinase CDK5. So this study investigating dysfunction in neural circuits has led to the discovery that sensory stimulation of 40 Hertz gamma oscillations and the associated synchrony produces widespread ameliorative effects, including a reduction in amyloid and tau pathology. So she has demonstrated that the enhanced gamma power recruits the brain's immune cells and the vasculature. Uh, Dr. Tsai is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academy of Inventors. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and an academician of the Academy, Ac Academia Sinica in Taiwan. She's a recipient of the Mika Salpeter Lifetime Achievement Award and the 2018 Hans Wigzell Research Foundation Science Prize for her research on Alzheimer's disease. We are very privileged to have her with us today, and uh, I, I ask her to take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Tsai. Uh, you, uh, Dr. Tsai, you're muted at the moment. Uh, thank you, Philip. That, that was quite an introduction. Um, I, you know, so special. Um, um, I really appreciate it. Um, so it's uh, absolutely a pleasure to be here um, to present our work. Um, so if I can share my screen. Great, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, that's good. So, okay, my list of point of view. Great. Um, so um, as Philip um, told you, um, today, I'm very excited to tell you about um, a, a completely non-invasive kind of um, brain stimulation uh, protocol that uh, we developed um, in the lab. And, um, and we found that this non-invasive uh, stimulation basically using light, and later on, we also um, uh, integrate sound um, into the stimulation um, really is beneficial uh, to the brain um, in um, animal models of neurodegeneration. But recently we started to have some very preliminary uh, data from uh, human subjects that I would like to share with you. The human data is not published. So this is uh, my disclosure slide. Um, I would like to particularly point out that uh, Cognito Therapeutics, a small biotech company, uh, licensed our technology and um, is currently conducting uh, larger scale um, human trials. So, um, uh, just, Dr. Um, Dr. Sai, could I just interrupt you? There's something um, rubbing up against your microphone. Oh, okay, okay. I will try to fix that. Okay, we'll. we'll is we'll, this, we'll is this better now? That's far, far better. I just didn't want uh, the whole lecture to go through, but thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt you. Great. So um, I just want to have a few words about um, dementia. So uh, with the extension of lifespan, um, obviously age-related diseases have been um, um, have risen rapidly, and the increase in the incidence of dementia is particularly alarming. Uh, today, according to a 2015 um, report, 
um, 47 million people uh, are living with dementia. And this number uh, will double or triple uh, in every continent in the next three decades. And the majority of the dementia cases are caused by Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is considered the most pervasive and urgent problem facing our modern society. And we do not currently have effective treatment. So we know that Alzheimer's disease is complex and takes at least 20 years to develop. It has very defined pathological features in the brain, um, as many of you have heard. Uh, they are um, abundant uh, amyloid plaques or senile plaques, as well as neurofibrillary tau tangles. But there are also other features such as loss of brain volume, uh, shrinkage of the brain, loss of synapses, um, and um, initially, um, it precipitates in um, uh, forgetfulness and other uh, cognitive impairment, but eventually um, uh, leads to dementia. And over the past several decades, um, research has um, um, revealed many, many cellular and subcellular defects that happen during the disease. And recently people also realized that the disease is not just about uh, the nerve cells known as neurons, but many other cells in the brain, other types of cells in the brain are also affected. Then there is this uh, genetic component of the disease as well. Um, in addition to um, uh, a few, of the genes with variants that can cause Alzheimer's disease um, that run in the family. Uh, there are also two to three dozens of other um, genetic loci in the human genome uh, that can significantly affect one's risk of uh, developing Alzheimer's disease in the lifetime. But despite all of this knowledge, we still don't completely understand the disease. And as I said, there is no effective treatment. And in fact, in the last 15 years or 20 years, uh, none of the new interventions succeeded in um, human trials. So among uh, other things, my laboratory has been studying neural circuit regulation and network activity in Alzheimer's. So today, I would like to focus on a particular uh, neural network activity known as oscillations or rhythms. I propose that an impairment of the 40 Hertz gamma rhythms and its co-activation across various brain regions undermines the brain's response. So let me just tell you a little bit about brain rhythms. In the mammalian cortex, there are at least 10 different classes of oscillations that cover more than four orders of magnitude in frequencies from the infraslow to the ultrafast. So as you heard from Philip, this hertz meaning um, how many times the neurons can fire per second, okay? Um, and one thing about um, all of these different frequencies of brain rhythms is that it's highly evolutionarily conserved uh, throughout evolution. So if you look at all of these different frequencies of oscillation, you can detect in very small mammals, such as mouse and rats. And even in the human brain, which um, is clearly um, much, much larger, but the frequencies still um, remain. So I think these facts really suggest that all of these different um, 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 
frequencies um, of oscillations, they all play um, important role in brain function. And as um, Philip pointed out, and um, I alluded to earlier, we are particularly interested in the so-called gamma oscillations, which ranges between um, 30 to uh, 80 Hertz. So just a very, very brief history of um, neural gamma oscillations. So neuronal oscillations actually were first observed more than a century ago as a fundamental brain activity um, in rabbits and in monkeys. And um, in the um, 20s and 30s, um, Hans Berger and others classified brain oscillations, including those in humans by their frequency, which range from infrasolow to ultrafast. And gamma oscillations were first reported in 1942 and um, identified in many brain regions, first in the olfactory bulb of hedgehogs. And uh, the scientist reported this is uh, named Agar Adrian. And further progress in the field led to association with, um, of rhythms with many different behaviors. And an explosion um, of research in the last 30 years, um, including seminal work from a German neuroscientist, Wolf Singer, has produced the theory that gamma oscillations synchronize within and across connected brain regions. And he and Yuri Busaki um, further proposed that gamma temporarily organize spike timing with functional consequences. Today, we know that gamma um, rhythms is highly specific to behavior state and key to information processing. Enhanced gamma power in the brain is observed when human subjects or animals are engaged in higher order uh, functions such as working memory, uh, sensory processing, um, and spatial navigation. Meanwhile, we still don't completely understand gamma. For instance, we don't know what are the cellular and molecular substrate of increased coherence um, associated with gamma. We don't know how neurons respond to gamma. We don't know whether, whether gamma impacts other brain cell types. So basically, we um, don't know what are the cellular signatures of gamma in the brain. One thing um, that um, has been reported over the years is that reduced gamma power is detected in multiple mouse models of Alzheimer's and also in uh, Alzheimer's human subjects. I'm showing you an example um, of um, a piece of data from my laboratory where we recorded uh, brain rhythms in a healthy wild type uh, mice or in a um, amyloid um, Alzheimer's disease mouse model known as the FATX FAD uh, model. And we specifically look into very young animals, three, three months old. So in this um, Alzheimer's model, three months old is uh, pre-symptomatic. They uh, don't show any behavior deficits or even overt um, pathological manifestation. So, um, so when we recorded um, uh, the um, rhythms in the brain, we found that, for instance, in the healthy animals, we see a very strong power of gamma oscillations, as you can see here, the, the uh, frequency range in the gamma range. But when we look at the three months old amyloid model, we found that there is already a very significant reduction in the gamma power of um, oscillations. So this was very surprising because 
this, as I said, this was this is the pre-symptomatic stage um, of the animals. So um, this observation also motivated us to really ask, since the reduced uh, power of gamma happened this early in the course of the disease, does it contribute to the later manifestation of the various pathology and symptoms? And these are um, a partial list of uh, the literature showing reduced gamma power in the many different Alzheimer's models, including amyloid model, a tau transgenic model, as well as a sporadic Alzheimer's disease uh, risk gene, APOE4 um, Nakin um, animals. So knowing that gamma power is reduced in Alzheimer's disease, um, people have attempted to increase gamma power in the brain. And uh, I should mention that um, a publication that um, um, really caught our eyes um, from uh, Jorge Palop's group at UCSF. Um, they also look at another uh, Alzheimer's disease amyloid transgenic mouse model. They call it um, HAPPJ20 um, animals. And um, in these animals, they also show uh, similarly the power of gamma oscillatory activity, especially centering around 40 Hertz is very much reduced. So what they did was to genetically manipulate a particular type of neurons known as inhibitory pop albumin positive neurons by overexpressing a um, voltage gated um, sodium channel um, into the cells. And they show that this manipulation greatly enhanced gamma oscillation power. And this is associated with improved cognitive function in this model. So we initially um, decided um, to see whether in our hand, um, if we increase gamma power is also beneficial to the Alzheimer's disease mouse model. So we use a different technique known as optogenetics, which is very, very invasive. What this involves is to, um, first of all, um, use a viral vector to um, um, uh, precisely introduce um, a, a, an opsin into a particular uh, part of the brain known as the hippocampus. Uh, hippocampus is the part of, of the brain known to regulate learning and memory function. We then uh, stick a, uh, um, 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 a fiber uh, into um, the, uh, that brain region so that we can use laser light to um, um, uh, activate the opsin in the neurons of um, um, uh, in, that, in the hippocampus. So, um, so this way we use 40 Hertz uh, laser pulses um, to um, introduce um, into the hippocampus of these mice. And what we can see is that when we uh, perform electrical recording, um, we can see that the 40 Hertz gamma power is um, very significantly increased after this manipulation. Okay, so this is not surprising uh, because um, this kind of manipulation has been um, reported before. But what was really surprising and um, in fact came as a shock to us was the following observations made by my um, former graduate student, Hannah Alcarino. So what she found is that in this um, uh, amyloid model, in the hippocampus, um, even though in this young age, we don't see overt amyloid plaque pathology, but the components of the amyloid plaque known as the um, beta amyloid peptides, those are the small peptides, they can aggregate, they can form um, um, fibrils and they can precipitate into the plaques. Um, 
when we look at the components in the hippocampus of this mice, we found that something is going on because um, we found that those mice receive one hour of the 40 hertz stimulation um, show about 50% reduction of the abundance of this um, uh, beta amyloid uh, peptides. So there are two different versions, one, a beta one to, one to 40 and a beta one to 42. And we found that with 40 hertz simulation, um, both peptides um, were cut uh, roughly uh, by half. Moreover, um, if we use a different frequency such as a hertz or use a random frequency stimulation, none of this manipulation reduced um, beta amyloid peptides. So only 40 hertz frequency reduce beta amyloid peptides. So I think you have to um, um, appreciate um, the uh, surprise uh, came with this observation because up until our experiment, everyone else, all the literature you can find, when they talk about brain rhythms, different classes of brain rhythms, they describe it in an extremely computational term, okay, or systems neuroscience term, brain rhythms, um, information processing speed, um, and maybe some sort of association with behavior states. But nobody, nobody has ever shown that these brain rhythms can actually change the biochemical um, aspects of the brain cells, okay? So, so because of this, in fact, many people in the field of neuroscience are extremely skeptical uh, when it comes to uh, brain rhythms. They claim that these brain rhythms are just epiphenomenon. They don't actually do anything. They're not important. But our observations for the first time show that's not true. Brain rhythms matter. And at a particular frequency, it changes um, the bio biochemical processes of the cells. So, um, so when we presented these results in our department, of course, my colleagues um, were very, very surprised. And, and some are more optimistic than others. So, um, so I remember Emery Brown, um, a um, brilliant uh, computational neuroscientist, and he himself is also a physician. He came to me and said, Li Wei, look, your observations may have tremendous translational potential, but this optogenetic approach that you have to introduce a virus into the brain and stick a, a, a fiber optic, it's just it's just too invasive. It's never gonna be done in humans. You gotta think of a way to manipulate the brain rhythms um, uh, non-invasively. So he challenged me. Um, so, you know, we, um, my graduate student, Hannah Alcarino and I went back um, and then, um, you know, um, thought about what can we do? So the only thing we can do is to go back to the literature and to see whether um, anyone has ever tried uh, to manipulate brain rhythms using non-invasive way. And really, again, Wolf Singer came to the rescue. So in this 1998 uh, publication, Rager and Singer, they performed the following experiment. So they actually shine light to cats and they uh, manipulate the light to flicker at different frequencies. And simultaneously, they also perform electrophysiological recordings in the visual cortex of the cats. So the visual cortex is part of the brain important for um, processing visual input to downstream brain uh, regions. So, um, so this is the results they show. So they presented the light flicker um, anywhere from zero to 50 hertz 
and then they recorded the response in the visual cortex. And what you can see is absolutely a linear relationship, meaning if you stimulate at 10 Hertz, then you can record 10 Hertz oscillation in the visual cortex, 20 Hertz, 20 Hertz, 40 Hertz, 40 Hertz. So we sort of all of a sudden, you know, we realized that at least in cats, it is possible to manipulate oscillations um, in the brain um, just by um, giving them different visual inputs. So the next question is whether this is going to work in mice because we know cats has great vision, but mice, they are not well known for their um, uh, good vision, right? So, um, so Hannah did the following thing. So she um, housed the animal, the mice in, um, in a cage, and then she surrounded the cage with LED light strip. And then she used a very, a very simple Arduino um, uh, system to manipulate the light to flicker at different frequencies. So, um, so this is um, the experiment. And then we, um, during the, um, the stimulation, we recorded um, uh, the neural activity in the visual cortex of this mice. And then there you can see when we presented 40 Hertz light flicker, then what we saw was a beautiful increase in the 40 Hertz um, oscillation power in the visual cortex. So in fact, this uh, sensory stimulation induced brain rhythms um, seems to be uh, pretty universal. It um, worked in cats and it also can work in mice. So we turn this um, approach, um, gamma entrainment using sensory stimuli or genus. So the next thing, of course, we wanted to know whether the sensory stimulation induced brain rhythms can also lead to beta amyloid peptides reduction. So, um, so Hannah performed the following experiment. Again, she exposed the mice just to the light flicker for an hour um, with different frequency of these light flickers. And then she harvested uh, the visual cortices, which is in the back of the brain. Okay, this is the olfactory bulb. Um, this is the back of the cortex, and this is the hind brain. And then we measure the abundance of beta amyloid peptide 1 to 40 and 1 to 42. And, um, and from the figures, I think you can appreciate. Again, we saw with 40 hertz light flicker stimulation. Uh, we saw a huge reduction of this amyloid peptides. And none of these other frequencies we use, including constant light, 20 hertz, 80 hertz, or random uh, light frequency, none of them uh, significantly reduced um, beta amyloid peptide abundance. So the next question then is um, the following. So, so far I show you that using sensory stimulation, namely um, light flicker, can entrain uh, neurons um, in the uh, visual cortex to produce rhythms, okay? But um, we know that a lot of the brain disorders such as Alzheimer's affects many different brain regions, uh, including the hippocampus. And in fact, the sensory cortices are not known to be particularly affected in neurodegeneration. So the question is whether this um, light flicker induced um, oscillations very local or it can be propagated to um, other parts of the brain. So to address this question, um, a postdoctoral fellow, China Adaikin, 
who um, is a fabulous um, electrophysiologist. He performed the following experiment. He um, produced a custom-made microdrive um, that can simultaneously target different um, regions of the brain. So he um, stick these electrodes into um, um, a awake, freely moving um, mouse. He then uh, turned on the light flicker to the mouse and then um, recorded the neural activity in the different parts of the brain. Okay, so, um, so this is a, um, um, so you can see the heat map um, of the neural activity um, in the spectrogram. So this is um, uh, LED light occluded and then uh, LED light exposure. So as soon as we, you know, turn on this uh, LED light and expose the mice, you can see there's a sharp increase of 40 Hertz um, um, oscillation uh, power in the visual cortex, which is not surprising. I told you earlier already, but you also see increased 40 Hertz uh, gamma power in the somatosensory cortex in the hippocampus, uh, which as I told you earlier, controls learning and memory and in the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain um, in charge of higher order brain functions, such as attention, uh, executive function, decision-making and so on. So this experiment would suggest that, in fact, light flicker induced neural oscillation can propagate to many different parts of the brain. Moreover, um, another um, uh, finding that China made, which I think is very interesting, is that he looked at co-activation of two different brain regions, such as co-activation between the visual cortex and the hippocampus or the visual cortex and the somatosensory cortex and so on um, at 40 Hertz. And what he found is very significant increased of co-activation among many of these different brain regions. So we call it coherence. And the increased coherence is usually translates to increased speed of information processing. So information in the brain can be processed with increased speed. Um, then um, subsequently, China asked um, whether, um, so so far I've shown you all of the exposure um, uh, with, um, um, which is always acute such as one hour um, exposure. So China wanted to know um, whether further beneficial effects can be achieved if he um, chronically exposed this um, uh, Alzheimer's model mice to genus. So, um, so this is the following experiment. He, he now used a much older um, amyloid model, 5 d mice, uh, nine months old, and by this age, you can see a very extensive precipitation of this famous uh, Alzheimer's um, pathological feature, uh, amyloid plaques. So you can see this magenta puncte kind of signals throughout the mouse brain uh, in the cortex and in the hippocampus. Then um, he exposes mice to a 40 Hertz light flicker. Um, one hour per day for a total of 21 days. He then measured the density of this uh, magenta amyloid plaques. And what he found is significant reduction of the abundance of these plaques, not just in the visual cortex, but also in the somatosensory cortex, in the hippocampus and in the prefrontal cortex. So it's not just that the gamma power can propagate to the whole brain, but it's um, beneficial effect in reducing um, beta amyloid um, uh, plaques can also propagate 
um, to many parts of the brain. Okay, so so far I exclusively um, talk about the amyloid. And you may wonder, there are many other uh, Alzheimer's um, pathological features such as um, neurofibular tau tangles. Is genus also beneficial um, to remove that? So here, uh, China uh, worked with the tau transgenic model known as the P01S, P19 mice. So these animals overexpress or produce um, a huge number of the um, 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 tau protein. Um, it's a, a, a variant version of the tau protein identified in patients with frontotemporal dementia. So you can see um, in um, this uh, quite of uh, this older tau mice um, um, with no stimulation. Uh, you can see this, um, this green uh, signal very abundant in this uh, nerve cells or neurons. Um, so this is the accumulation of this pathogenic tau protein. And you don't really see this in a healthy wild type control um, animal. Remarkably, with one hour per day, 21 days of uh, exposure, to the live liquor, I think you can appreciate there is a, a profound reduction of this uh, pathogenic form of the tau protein. And China again quantify in different uh, brain regions and he was able to show this beautiful reduction uh, of the tau protein um, in uh, all of the different brain regions that um, he evaluated. So, um, so the live flicker exposure for, at 40 hertz uh, not only removes amyloid, it also removes tau uh, pathology. A third feature of um, uh, Alzheimer's I alluded to earlier is loss of brain volume. Um, so uh, China now turned to a third transgenic mouse model that is known to show tremendous loss of brain volume and loss of um, uh, the density of uh, the nerve cells. So this is known as the CKP25 mice. So without stimulation, uh, you can see this animal show great expansion of the uh, ventricles in the brain, which um, is also a very strong feature in human um, uh, patient with Alzheimer's disease and the thinning of um, the, uh, the brain structure compared to a healthy control animals. And then again, uh, when he exposed this mice for um, uh, one hour per day and a total of six weeks, you can see the expansion of the ventricle is ameliorated and the brain structure um, um, you can see a recovery of um, the thickness of um, the cortex. And further, if you look at individual neurons here, uh, as shown as magenta here, um, you can see the density of these uh, neurons is reduced without stimulation, but restored after stimulation. So we can see multiple uh, beneficial effects of life flicker stimulation in uh, many different um, neurodegeneration mouse models. So, so far um, I show you um, that it is possible to um, use um, life flicker or visual stimulation to entrain neurons in the brain. But we also know that we are endowed with many different senses. So, um, so one of the questions we would like to address is whether we can take advantage of the other senses to entrain neurons. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple pieces of result that we show that it is also possible to um, increase um, the power of um, um, oscillations using sound. So this is a very close collaboration with Ed Boyden's laboratory. Um, 
and especially with um, his former graduate student Ho Jun Suk, who um, really helped develop this uh, algorithm uh, for um, auditory stimulation, especially for mice, because mice have a very different um, um, sort of um, hearing range um, from humans. So, um, so we came up with this algorithm using 10 megahertz tone presented at uh, 25 millisecond interval. So this is 40 hertz per second. And uh, we found that when we present this um, kind of uh, sound stimulation to mice, um, then in the auditory cortex and in the hippocampus, we can uh, rarely detect this regular uh, 40 hertz firing of uh, neurons in these brain regions. But more importantly also is that in the amyloid uh, mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, um, when we look at amyloid plaques as shown in green here, uh, we found that with um, 40 hertz auditory stimulation, there is a profound reduction of this amyloid plaques in both the auditory cortex and in the hippocampus after um, 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 chronic um, exposure to this um, auditory stimulation. So um, what about we combine light and sound? whether we can see additional beneficial effects. So the sure answer is yes. Um, I'm not going to show you all of this data um, that we documented with this combined light and sound stimulation, but I'm gonna just use um, these movies to illustrate my point. So, um, so what the combined stimulation uh, does, um, which is better, than a single modality stimulation. And later on, I think you can also see it in our experiments in humans, is that it really helped to propagate uh, the 40 Hertz gamma power uh, to different brain regions um, um, in a more uh, timely manner. So we can shorten the time it takes um, to achieve the reduction of amyloid pathology. So here um, we collaborated with Kong Hong Chang uh, where he developed a method to clear the entire brain. Um, so we rendered the brain transparent and then we um, came in to use amyloid antibody to identify all of the amyloid plaques. So here uh, with no stimulation, you can just see you know, all of this punctate kind of amyloid plaques distribution throughout the entire brain in the cortex, but also in um, the deeper parts of the brain, okay? But with auditory plus visual stimulation, what we found is the um, whole cell reduction of this amyloid plaques, not just in the cortex and in the hippocampus, but also in the deep part of the brain. So we can see a whole brain reduction of amyloid plaques, very significant reduction with just one week of one hour per day of um, auditory plus visual stimulation. So, um, so now I show you all of this reduction of pathology, but what about function of the brain? Um, and I'm going to just um, show you one piece of data um, and we have done um, the um, experiment uh, testing uh, cognitive function using uh, many different uh, behavioral tasks. And in general, I can tell you that um, multiple strains of the mice, it doesn't matter whether it's amyloid or tau or, or, um, or degeneration or even aged mice, uh, after they are exposed to um, light or sound or combined stimulation uh, chronically, they um, show very nice um, reduction of the level of anxiety. And uh, they appear to be much more calm. And when it comes to um, learning a memory task, I'm going to tell you especially um, about these results using the so-called Morris water maze um, behavioral task, which um, is to evaluate 
the spatial learning and memory of um, the mice. So what you do is to put a mouse in a, a swimming pool uh, filled with murky water. And uh, mice uh, inherently, they don't like to be in the water. So um, they will quickly look for escape. So, um, so what you do is to put a platform submerged underneath the surface of the water. So they cannot see where the platform is. But if they swim around, um, they will eventually find the platform. So we place the mice to the swimming pool on a daily basis and initially look at the time it took for the mouse to um, reach the escape platform, okay? And, um, and I think um, you can um, appreciate um, in all of the different uh, mouse models, um, when we place the, this mice in the swimming pool. Um, so this is the curve representing with every day of training, um, the time it takes for the different mice to reach the platform. And I think the important thing to see is with the daily training, uh, the mice is, should take less and less time to find the platform if they learn uh, to locate the platform. But with 40 hertz stimulation group, so we have three groups, no stimulation, 40 hertz stimulation or random frequency stimulation in this particular experiment, only the 40 hertz group, um, they show very significant reduction in um, locating the platform. And this um, difference is, in, um, is significant when compared to the no stim group or the random simulation group. Furthermore, um, on the last day, what we did was to remove this platform altogether and place the mouse back to the, the swimming pool. So the pool mice, they're gonna, you know, they if they remember um, in this particular uh, quadrum of um, the swimming pool, the platform used to be there, they tend to spend a lot more time here to look for the platform. So we basically quantify uh, the time the mouse spend in the different quadrant of um, the swimming pool. And you can see the 40 hertz group spend significantly more time in this quadrant than this other groups. Um, indication that they already remember where the platform um, used to be. Um, so, um, so in all of the different mouse models, we consistently see the 40 hertz stimulated group um, perform better, show better spatial learning and memory. Okay, now, so I show you a whole bunch of um, beneficial effects, but um, you know, my laboratory is really a lot more a mechanism kind of laboratory. We want to understand how does this all happen? And um, I can just tell you now, I don't have all the answers, okay? Um, I think we are getting there. And, um, and what I would like to do is to share with you what I do know. So the brain, um, um, harbors many different cell types. The nerve cells or neurons is just um, one cell type you see in the brain. The brain also has microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and blood vessel cells. And this microglia in particular are extremely interesting group of cells. They are actually immune cells. They are the brain's innate immune cells. They constantly um, uh, send out these processes to survey the environment. And if they sense that there's some injury happened to the nerve cells, they will come in quickly to remove the debris. And if they can sense any metabolite, uh, or other waste in the brain, they will also come in to remove that. However, in the chronic toxic environment, this microglia would transform into a inflammatory state and they will become a factory, keep releasing um, toxic cytokines and chemokines and do further damage to the brain. Okay, so here I'm going to show you some short videos 
of how this microglia look in a healthy um, mouse brain or in the CKP25 mice. Remember, these mice have a lot of um, uh, neurodegeneration, loss of neurons, and brain atrophy. And then the CKP25 mice up to 40 hertz uh, chronic stimulation. So now you can see this microglia, they show this nice ramified morphology and they show this tiling kind of distribution. So they don't really, you know, invade into each other's boundary. Okay, now is the microglia how they look in the neurodegeneration state without 40 hertz. You, now you see they totally lost this beautiful ramified or tiling distribution. And here, what you see is a cluster of microglia. They pile right on top of each other and uh, look totally not like microglia anymore, okay? And then finally, here is what the microglia like after chronic 40 Hertz live flicker stimulation. They pretty much revert back to this normal ramified looking uh, tiling kind of distribution. So you can see this, you know, again, you know, I think a lot of people told me that when they see this kind of data, it's a watershed, watershed moment. Because this is the first time anybody ever show that this kind of neuronal oscillation phenomena can actually um, change the morphology and very likely function of a different cell types in the brain. So we wanted to know further how the microglia respond to um, this chronic uh, uh, genus stimulation. So, um, so this is a very molecular experiment. I'm gonna just at a very high level tell you the idea of this experiment. So what China did was after chronic stimulation, he um, was able to purify this microglia from the brain and then he uh, performed an experiment known as RNA sequencing. Basically, is to look to see whether there is um, there are changes in gene expression in this microglia. Because if there are changes in gene expression, it more likely, most likely, gonna change the function of the microglia. So, um, so we have um, um, several groups of animals. So we have the CKP25 mice without stimulation and compared to a healthy um, animal just to see how the microglia change in neurodegeneration. So what you see is that increased expression of genes involved in immune response, inflammation, and apoptotic pathway, which is cell death. And down regulation of genes involving motility, and other homeostatic function of microglia. But now, um, after 40 hertz stimulation, we compare the treated uh, animals versus untreated animals. And here, what we see is reduced expression of this immune response, inflammation response genes, and then increased expression of membrane trafficking, vesicular transport, and catabolic process uh, genes. So basically restore motility and homeostatic function of microglia. So basically this experiment, um, this uh, gene expression signature experiment is very consistent with the morphological analysis of um, um, the experiment that I show you in the previous slide, which is this um, stimulation can restore normal microglia function. And I, um, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so just to come here also, so China um, also um, purify nerve cells or neurons from treated animals and look at gene expression changes. And what he was able to show is that um, the stimulated animals show tremendous increase 
in the expression of chemical synaptic transmission and dendrite development, long-term potentiation, vesicular transport, synaptic transport um, uh, category of genes. So basically increase synaptic function as well as um, plasticity um, of the synapses. In addition, he also um, used immunostaining to look at literally uh, the density of synapses and show that while in the neurodegeneration model, the synaptic density is reduced by following uh, chronic treatment, synaptic density is restored. So, um, so this 40 Hertz exposure is very beneficial for synaptic function. And, um, and microglia and neurons are not the only cell types responded to genus. Um, uh, Anthony Martiro, my former graduate student, found that astrocytes, which are known to be the type of glial cells that normally support the functional neurons, their number can be increased following for the heart stimulation as well. So astrocytes also respond to the increase for the heart's oscillation. And finally, not just microglia, astrocytes, and neurons, turned out that the blood vessels in the brain also responded. This is um, just um, phenomenal. Um, so the brain is full of vasculature, especially capillaries. They are extremely abundant in the brain because our brain cells need a lot of energy uh, in order to support it, their function. So this uh, abundant capillaries and vasculature constantly supply oxygen um, and glucose to support the energy needs of um, the brain cells. And so what um, Anthony found is that following for the Hertz stimulation, the overall diameter of those capillaries is very significantly increased. Okay, and uh, later on, 